Cool. Welcome back for part two of our pen test process. Uh, obligatory contact slide. We'll talk about that at the end. My name is Tim Medine. I am uh, one of the principal consultants, founder, whatever, CEO, whatever title you want it, here at, uh, at Red Siege. I've been pen testing for uh, over a decade. I think it's like 11 years in an official pen test role. So I want to try to bring some of that experience into the conversation here. Um, by the way, I'm also the lead author of, and well, and instructor of the SANS Security 560, the ethical hacking and network penetration course, tenant testing course. And as well, uh, I'm a, I teach the advanced pen test course at SANS and the IONS faculty, pen testing for a, a long time. So my goal with this series is to sort of give you chunks and nuggets from class, from my SANS class, right? Um, so uh, I just give you little pieces here. Again, give us a little bit of interactivity. Um, so feel free to ask some of those questions, but feel free to check out the course as well. Love to see you there as well. As I mentioned, this is part two of a three-part webcast series. We have a, a previous one, the start. So what do we do to prepare for our test? Uh, feel free to check that out. Now, just because you miss that one, that is totally fine. There's no required reading. That means you have to go back and watch part one before uh, part two. Uh, so the previous one, we talked about some of the, the process. How do we go about setting one up? Today, we're going to talk through some of the, the method a little bit. Um, and then next time, we're going to spend a lot of time on the, re on the report and the deliverable because that's super, super important. Is it the, the sexy fun talk that everybody wants. Well, I mean, I think it's going to be fun and I'm, I'm pretty sexy, but um, reporting is so very important. Even if you don't write a full, huge report, there are little nuances that we're going to cover in our next discussion that will give you better presentation skills, um, maybe better emails, better when you have to write up other kinds of reports, whatever. So you can check, it, check us out, the part three. Again, links are going to be on uh, the screen here. You can register now. This isn't uh, happening in the past. So understanding the target. So a quick recap of part one. Um, you, you've got to understand who you're targeting. This isn't just a, a pen test where you're like, I'm going to hack stuff. I don't care who they are. I don't need to know anything about them. I can do this. Wham, bam, and I'm done. No, to get a, a high value pen test to help the defenders do a better job, better defend, you have to tailor your test to tailor your test to some degree. We have to understand their goals, understand the uh, the test, understand the, the organization's risk. Yes, you can just do your test and chuck the report over the wall and be done, but you're going to lose some value. Now, if you're one of the RCPT, as I mentioned, they're really crappy Ben Desert, so you can chuck it over the wall, it's fine, but we're here as offensive people to help defense get better. And if we don't help the defenders, if the defenders don't leave this interaction with a better understanding of their, their own network and configurations, misconfigurations and issues, if they don't have a, a plan to mitigate, to get better, we have failed. And then we as offensive people have quite literally been a waste of time and money. And, and I don't like to be a waste of uh, time and money. So let's talk a little bit. We're going to go live with our test now. We got a little bit of prep, right? Well, this is going to be a couple of days, you know, getting a little bit more of the, uh, the hands-on piece here. We need to get ready for our test, right? Now, some of you, I don't know if you've, you've heard the story, like, hey, if you, you build a better, better mousetrap, the world would be a path to your door. I mean, that's pretty much crap. H how many of you can make a better burger than what you get at McDonald's? Now, you had better be able to make a burger better than McDonald's, but guess which one? I mean, my guess is you're not a multi-billionaire watching this presentation, right? So 
there, there's more. There's there's process related to this thing uh, as well, right? It's just not well. I, I'm the best. No, no. There, there's a lot more to some of these things. Now, an important um, lesson here. This is sort of I read I wrote this a lot for. Hey, I haven't done a pen test before, and this is my first one. Now what? Right. Well, the key thing to remember, and this is sounds obvious, but it's sometimes not obvious. I don't know about you, but I need an obvious kick in the pants from time to time. Like, hey, knucklehead, have you thought about the obvious thing? In life, you don't know what you're doing until you do, right? I mean, of course, Tim, but have you ever watched, um, like maybe you've got some some piece of your life that you're really good at. You have a you know a ton about, and you read an article, a story, blog post, whatever, and somebody has has, has talked about, reported on that thing that you know a ton about, and they're completely wrong. You're like, oh my gosh, this, this is this is this is this is crazy. This is incorrect. Right? How? And then if you think about that, it's like, well, this is the one thing I know a lot about. What are things I don't know about, but I'm reading these articles about, whatever it might be, and I'm taking it, and maybe there's something a little bit wrong in some of those pieces, right? And I always start to wonder when I see that, like, how much of life, how much of quite literally everything I do is held together by duct tape and bailing wire? Go back to McDonald's. Right. McDonald's and Taco Bell and such, they have a turnover of like 200 and something percent. Literally, they replace their entire staff on average about once every eight months, if I remember the stat correctly. But what they have is a process. Now, and I'm not picking on people that work at McDonald's because, well, frankly, I worked at McDonald's at one point. No bully, uh, you know, cooking burgers in the back. But what they have done is they've built a process. So even though you've got the the knucklehead kid in high school, me, right? They can still deliver the same product. Now there's a lot of discussions about the product, but you go to one McDonald's versus the next McDonald's, the, the burger is pretty much the same. And it could be any sort of a chain. These processes are the important piece to deliver the same thing from time and time again, right? And when we get into our test, you know, feel free to admit that you don't know. In fact, I highly encourage you when you're doing your very first test, and this is beyond it just testing, ask questions. Uh, I posted a Twitter poll last night, like, hey, if you were giving advice to a new tester, if you're a new tester, what's the one thing that you would find valuable? And over and over again, I've, I got somebody saying, ask questions. I find this to be very true. I, I don't know about you, but when I was early in my pen test career, um, you know, I'm the new pen tester. I was a little cocky. And I was, to be honest, a little bit overconfident. And I didn't take that step back. I wasn't willing to say, I don't know. I, I wasn't willing necessarily to ask questions of other people because I knew and I, I, I'm the expert. But ask the questions. If you've got other senior folks, I mean, you just saw us probably uh, bantering beforehand. We bounce ideas off each other all the time, both inside the organization, outside, friends, colleagues, whatever it might be, ask questions. The dirty little secret about pen testing is we do a lot of Googling. Like, hey, I found this thing. What is this? I have no earthly idea. Go to Google and don't be ashamed about it. It is the thing. I, I'm quite certain that most of IT problems are solved via Google, specifically Stack Overflow, right? So use the resources you have available to you. Don't, and don't feel any sort of shame with that. Makes it more efficient, saves time. Literally ask anybody. And if you want to, go to the expert. If you've got a specific tool that you're using, you might throw a question to the author. Now, if you do that, you know, don't 
be aware that they have other time constraints, especially if it's a very popular popular person. But if you're at a conference and you go to a talk and you're trying to understand something, they will usually the, the speaker will, will usually talk to you afterwards because they're super excited about what they just did, and they're really excited that you're excited that they're excited, and it's just uh, a tremendous uh, opportunity. So related to that, ask the dumb questions. Never assume. This is a big deal, right? If you're like, ah, yeah, I, I know we can do, I know we can do this kind of test in this environment. Great. Now, if something happens and it, it, it's your fault or could be blamed on you, whether it is, your, is yours or not, guess what? You're going to be blamed for it. And it might not have an impact on your career or anything like that. Do that enough times, and you start to get a reputation. Not one that you, you probably want. So if your question, hey, is this thing in scope? Cool, ask. It's so much easier to ask the question up front than say, oh, we went out of scope. And now we're tacking a different organization, uh, software, hardware that might be owned by somebody else. Now we have to loop them in. It's going to make you more efficient. Another thing to not be afraid of. If you're doing your test, ask your target questions. Ideally, this is a collaborative exercise meant to make the organization security better. So you ask them, just, just ask them some questions and they might say, here's the answer. Quite literally, I've done this plenty of times on tests where I ask and say, hey, what are the pain points? What are the issues you're trying to solve? And I'll jump into some of those to show it in the report because like it or not, sometimes the way they get budgeting, time allocations, whatever it might be, is because an issue shows up in a report, whether it's internal or external. Um, it is what it is. So if you're a blue teamer, use your pen testers. Guide them, right? Tell them, hey, you know what? This thing I've been working on for a while and trying to get fixed. Can you beat the crap out of that? That would help me a ton. Ask those questions much more efficient. Never assume, ask the dumb questions because I don't, I, I don't feel comfortable asking the dumb questions, but I really hate being wrong. So I would rather ask than not ask and uh, be wrong, right? All right, so check off before you begin. Do you have all of the paperwork? Do we have approvals from everybody? Scope, contact info, all that kind of jazz. If so, at this point, it is go time, okay? So we're ready to begin the test. A key thing here, and we're gonna talk more about reporting a little bit later. Uh, in part three, actually. So I'm not going to go too much into depth, but the other thing that people told me time and time again, in fact, the one that said beyond um, ask questions was report as you go. If you have time to get on Twitter and live tweet your pen test, and you're telling me you don't have time to live report, you are a horrible manager of your time. Report as you go. What you might encounter, and this has happened to me, where you find an issue, and I, this was earlier in my career, I didn't take this screenshot. I let the client know, hey, I found a really bad thing, but then they quickly go in and fix it. Now I don't have documentation. I, I don't have the screenshot. I don't have any of that stuff because I haven't taken that. Or and this has happened to everybody I know who does the most of the reporting at the end, is you get to the end of the report, and you're like, oh, I didn't get that screenshot. Hey, now you make it up in Photoshop, you, you completely skip the screenshot, and if you write your report as you go, you don't have that. Also, reporting isn't the most fun. Right? So if you save it all to the end, now you got this whole bunch of boring reporting at the end. If you report as you go, when the test is done, your report is like 95% done. You do a quick one th run through and you're good to go. In fact, I had a recommendation, and I love this idea, is if you've got, let's say you've got a week test or a two week test, 
at the end of each day, spend 20 to 30 minutes touching up the report. So that way, when you get to the very last day, all you really need to do is write the executive summary and then tweak the last bit that you did on that, that last day, on that Friday, and you're done. And you are ready to rock and roll. And there's no, oh, I forgot to document this. Oh, I forgot to get that screenshot. It's just done. Related to that, know your reporting tools, Word, Snagit, et cetera. Again, we'll talk more. We're going to spend an entire um, session next in the next pen test process talking entirely about reporting. I love to geek out about reporting. Related to the documentation, take good notes. So one of the things that we do as part of our reports is we've got a very detailed methodology. And, and that, to some degree, serves as our notes. But there's some things you're not going to put in there. Like, hey, I've cracked a bunch of passwords. I want to know the exact maybe command I use so that I can use it again, copy and paste it. Uh, if I'm the first one on the team using a tool, hey, here's how to use this thing so we can share it with other people. So, frankly, I can use it again. right? Even I, I've learned how to use this. I need notes for myself in the future to redo this. Uh, passwords you find, you shouldn't put passwords into the report, so take notes with that. So take good notes. That said, that is not a substitute for reporting as you go. Reporting as you go is a piece of your notes, but it isn't all of it. You can't, don't just say, well, I take good enough notes and I'll report afterwards. I highly encourage you to not do that. Otherwise, you can get to the end of your test. And what I've seen time and time again, if people don't report as they go, they've got their notes, and then they start to work on the report on Friday, the last day of the test. And now they don't have enough time to finish that report. So now that report pushes into the next week when they're working on something else. And it just absolutely starts to stack. So report it as you go, you will thank yourself. Because it, it's really nice when that report is done, Five o'clock hit button hits, and the, re the reports, your test is done, so is the report, your weekend is clear. There's no, hey, I need to make up for this because I'm behind. Don't be that person. I, I, I can tell you from personal experience, I, I can tell you from the experience of many other people, take good notes and report as you go. There's no such thing as too many notes. I've never been upset. We're like, well, I clearly documented that too heavily. But there are plenty of times where I've been like, oh, I didn't document that enough. That's going to be a, a problem, right? Um, Jeff has a comment here. I'm going to inter interject because I, I love Jeff's insight. The absolute bare minimum, and I, I like that he says, is noticing that in that moment, that magical moment that, hey, something is going to be a finding. That's when you want to grab the notes, grab the screenshot. Because what the, the thing that happens, especially if you're newer to this, is you're going to see something you're like, yeah, I know I need to write that up. And you get super excited and you go down the rabbit hole. And now you're like, oh, I'm like five exploits deep now. And I don't have any screenshots. And I kind of forgot how I got from here to here. And now you have to try to remember that and, and maybe you misremember it and you definitely don't want to turn a report You're like, yeah, this happened. Yeah, later we ended up over here, right? So take the screenshots. Even if you're, you're in the report, as you report, as you go, take the screenshots, put in there like, I did this, I did this, and then kind of come back. Again, you could use that 20 to 30 minutes at the end of the day to clean this up as, as you as well. But over document, not under document, uh, et cetera. All right, okay, so let's talk about the typical order of a, a pen test. Now, there's a lot of different pieces here in a test, and there's a lot of different definitions. We talked earlier that a test, the only reason for a, a pen test is to make the target organization better. So your one size fits all pen test isn't going to fit everybody. 
different organizations have different needs. In fact, um, Mike and I were on a call yesterday and somebody asked like, well, you guys did a, um, a, a purple team. Is that better than an assumed breach? Or is it better than the pen test? Which one's better? And Mike had a very eloquent answer. It summed up it, it completely depends. Do you want fast and efficient? Cool, give me the assumed breach. Do you want to test your defenders and their capabilities, their detections, right? So it, it very much depends. It, it, it's, it's kind of funny. We get people that email say, hey, we want to pen test him. I'm like, okay, cool. cool. Do you have a time to, to set up a call to discuss what you're looking to do? And every once in a while, they're like, it's just a pen test. And I'm like, oh, it's not because you're different than other people. Your needs are different. What you're looking to do here is going to be a little bit uh, different. All right. Um, so typical order here, start off with some reconnaissance, right? I put reconnaissance here because I, I recon here. I, I can't spell reconnaissance. I, I spelled it right one time. And I didn't get the red squiggly marks underneath it. So I thought my spell checker was broken. And I spent the next five minutes trying to fix my spell checker, only to realize I spelled the word correctly. Um, footprinting, scanning. Right? This is now live. We are starting to poke and prod. We'll discuss some of that. Password guessing absolutely must be part of a modern test. Passwords are so absolutely critical. And then our exploitation and our post-exploitation. Let's talk through uh, each of these various pieces. Now, remember, we might not have all of these pieces. I'm trying to give you a, a lot. You know, we've only got like an hour, and I'm trying to condense <laughs> six days of comment, content into an hour kind of to cherry pick a lot. But, for example, we might not have reconnaissance in our test, depending on the test type. If I've got a PCI pen test, and I'm looking specifically at the CDE and the segmentation, maybe there's no reconnaissance for that, okay? Uh, if, if I want an unannounced test, if I'm trying to test the defender's detection and response capabilities, I, I, I might do limited scanning or no scanning, right? Uh, maybe we'll use a phone scanner, maybe we won't. Again, it depends on the test. It's very much uh, tailored. All right, so let's talk about reconnaissance. I can't, I can't spell. I'm not even sure if that's spelled right. Um, so what is the goal of reconnaissance? Well, we want to find out information about the target before the test necessarily begins, before we start sending traffic or attacking. In fact, we've got, and this isn't a, a shameless plug, but we've got a ton of blog posts on reconnaissance. In fact, I was looking earlier today on the uh, the pages that were hit most often on our website. And I think three of the top 10 were um, the, the reconnaissance blog posts. So feel free to check some of those pieces out. We literally did an entire webcast on that as well. Um, so I, I obviously I don't have time to redo an entire uh, webcast or five different blog posts, but feel free to check some of those pieces out. Um, so Host discovery. This is a, a not uncommon, I find it to be not the most efficient, but whatever, um, where we need to figure out our targets. Sometime an organization will come to us and say, hey, I'm going to give you our domain. I'm going to pick, um, I don't know, looking on my desk here, tomato.com. We're tomato.com. And go. Okay. So then you use that to find host. Now, if you're doing some of that, what you want to do is once you identify live IP addresses or networks, get confirmation that those IP addresses are in scope, are owned by them before you start attacking. But we find hosts uh, that way. Find the domains, maybe find subdomains or similar type uh, names. Employee and user recon, super important. We're going to use that for a wide number of attacks. Phishing, definitely going to need that for our password attacks, especially things like password spraying attacks. Um, we want to speed things up with automation. There's a lot to do here. Now, some of the automation is great. I like Spiderfoot, but Spiderfoot gives you way more information than you could 
possibly find useful. It goes way out of scope sometimes. So a lot of that is interesting. We need to pair some of that back. And there's some other tools that Corey mentions in the blog post there uh, as well with the uh, uh, number four there. Active reconnaissance. Now, this is where some people get a little bit sticky. They're like, well, reconnaissance. You shouldn't send any traffic at all. Yeah, okay. But how about if we just use normal traffic? So there's things like uh, eyewitness. I love eyewitness. I'll use this to say, give me a quick look at the front page of every single web server inside an organization. And what it allows me to do is quickly triage. Like, okay, uh, SharePoint, SharePoint, admin interface. Ooh, I, I like that admin interface because there's oftentimes default credentials or, or bad craptastic passwords, right? So lots to unwrap here well, with, with reconnaissance for, uh, for some of that. Uh, scanning. Scanning is an important part of your testing. Again, depends on the design of your test. So many times with an external, even the internals, we want to do a lot of discovery. So we can speed things up with things like math scan, but it mass scan but doesn't have the same features and capabilities as things like uh, Nmap. We'll talk more about uh, faster scanning here in a little bit. Alternatively, maybe we wanna do some discovery, but we don't wanna be super, super loud. I don't wanna hit all ports on all systems throughout the entire organization. Maybe I don't have time to do that either. Right, so there's going to be some trade-offs here. So it's important for you to understand some of your scanning tools. Now, if we wanna go fast, we've got plenty of tools out there. My personal favorite is MassScan. Um, MassScan is asynchronous. What that means is it's gonna send SYN packets and then not care about the responses. For example, if I open up my browser, and I try to go to a website, it's gonna send a SYN packet and then wait for the response. MassScan don't care. MassScan says, SYN, 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 SYN's all over the place. And then when it receives a response, it's gonna look at that response and say, oh yeah, that's one of mine. Mark that port is open. But it's not going to block, it's not going to wait for that particular response. Very, very cool tool. Much, much more efficient for scanning larger networks. Be careful though, you can very easily overwhelm the, uh, the network. All right, Nmap. This is, I think, everyone's, one of their top tools. Probably if I did a, we did a poll on Twitter, Nmap would be the top scanning tool out there. This is a great tool. It is, however, slower than mass scan. Yeah, yeah, right. My mass scan is my my scanning machine gun. <laughs> it just, just unload those SYN packets. Nmap, what it will do is it's gonna break the targets up into groups and it will scan group by group. And if you've got a slow target in that group, it will then slow down the entire scan. Cool thing with Nmap is it's got tons of cool capabilities. We can do service scanning, version scanning. There's all sorts of additional scripts inside of Nmap that we can use. Tremendously useful tool. My favorite, my preferred approach is to use MassScan. Whoops, where's my MassScan? Oh, whatever. Somewhere right here. There we go. MassScan in combination with Nmap. So I use MassScan to say, find me the hosts that are up and the services that are listening. And then I take the live hosts and the live ports and I say, Nmap, only look at these hosts and ports. And it makes Nmap now more efficient because Nmap doesn't need to recheck those open ports. There's no, uh, there should be less slowness. If I send a SYN packet in and immediately get a SYN packet back, that's very quick. Whereas if I send a SYN packet in and I'm waiting for a response, was the packet dropped? 
is there a firewall that dropped the the packet and I didn't get that? Um, is is the host just not even there, right? And Nmap is going to do some to some degree waiting for that. So if I give Nmap a tire list, hosts that I know are up, the ports that I know are open, now it's going to be much much faster. All right. So what if what if I need to do some limited scanning? Right? I'm not going to fire up my mass scan at 15,000 packets per second. I need to go low and slow. Attackers need to pivot throughout the network. And, and to do that, they need to figure out where to go next. Many times that's through some internal reconnaissance or situational re awareness. Many times there's going to be some even limited probing. Hey, can I get over to this particular system? Can I find other hosts that are open and accessible on port 80 or 443 or admin interfaces on 22 or God forbid 23, whatever it may be. So we can take those tools and pair them back to some degree to figure out still where the next host is. And even if you're going super, super quiet, you still oftentimes have to do this to some degree. You might send one packet every minute to keep it nice and low and slow and um, ignore, you know, sorry, sorry, or to get a SIM to ignore you. Question here is, so Nmap is synchronous. To a degree, yes. It's a little bit longer of a, a question, but you'll notice if you Nmap a large number of hosts versus mass scan, the mass scan will go drastically faster because it doesn't do, doesn't do some of the chunking. So there's sort of synchronous with Nmap, if you will, in those host groups. Super important part of test these days, password attacks. Password guessing is super, super important. It's also a way to break things in epic fashion very, very quickly. So make sure you have this conversation up front. Now, this is a conversation that you wanna have where you might have to do a little bit of sales. If you come at them and say, hey, we're gonna do password guessing, or might lock out some accounts. The target's gonna be like, mm, how about no? If you come back and you tell them, Hey, we're gonna we need to do password guessing because it's the one of the biggest ways attackers are getting into organizations today. We do have the, the possibility of lockouts. What can we do to minimize the risk? Right? You see here, if you word it that way, you're gonna get a different response. Sales is a thing. I was listening to a really interesting book. Um audio book with Tim Ferriss wrote uh, actually yesterday on my run. And one of the people he was interviewing said, be good at more than one thing. His quote was specialization is for insects. You can be good, great at one thing, but you're going to be so much more valuable if you're good at a few things. Notice I didn't say great. You're not going to be the best pen tester in the world and the best presenter in the world at the same time. Not, not going to happen. But you can be a good pen tester and a good presenter, right? And those two pieces together make you a, a unicorn. So that's how we need, we need to frame some of the, uh, the discussions here uh, as well. So one of the things you can do is you can ask about the lockout and say, hey, what are your lockout thresholds? At what point am I going to lock accounts? Now, there are tools that will look at those fine-grained password policies. For example, Domain Password Spray by Bo Bullock. But be aware there are specific cases where things can go sideways. Uh, we did a, recently did a uh, an AMA, um, I guess a couple of webcasts ago, and each of us testers talked through, each of us registered each testers talked through a situation where things went sideways. 
Um, is it fun? No. It does it kind of painful to talk about where we made mistakes? Yeah. Can hopefully people learn from our mistakes and not create the same mistakes? Ideally, that's the goal. Uh, Mike talks about a situation where he used the tool and still locked out accounts. And to be honest, in fairness to Mike, that one wasn't even really his fault. Um, but there are specific cases. In this particular case, there was some of the fine-grained password policies that the tool he also was not able to read. So they did some additional lockouts of service accounts. Longer story, feel free to check out that. Uh, Justin, you want to post the, uh, the link there for that? That was our AMA. Uh, so great for things like SMB, lots of other tools. Hydra is my personal go-to. That's what we discuss in 560 uh, for um, other services. Now we're doing password guessing. Remember here, we have to worry about lockout. With password cracking, I've got password hashes saved locally, and I can go as fast as my hardware and my tooling will let me go. With password guessing online, password guessing. I can go only as fast as the network allows me. On top of that, there might be defenses that said, you're going too fast. I'm going to tell you no, no matter what. Uh, I'm going to lock this account. So even if you get it, you can't get in. So our password selection, what we want to do is be very careful. Pick a very small list. What we commonly do here is password spraying which means we use a large number of accounts and a single password or very few passwords. Well, which passwords should we use? The best ones are breach passwords. There's, there's resources, I know Dehashed has this. Um, we've got some public repos we have, or sorry, private repos we have access to. There's other uh, others available free, um, sort of Skylaya, and there's a Pwn DB, Pwn Password DB, which is very flaky on a Tor that you might be able to use. It's not down again. But when a user at an organization creates an account someplace else, they might select a password for that place. And it might be the same password they use internally. So now if third-party site, right, uh, tomato.com is now brown, uh, compromised. Well, I guess I should, toma tomato was my target before. Uh, we'll say uh, Apple, well, no, whatever, you know what I mean. <laughs> Let's say LinkedIn. LinkedIn is compromised because it happened. Someone got those password hashes, cracked it. Maybe those users use the same password at their tomato HQ. And now we can use those breach credentials to get in. Other common ones, season in year. I mean, you probably heard this, everyone knows the story, right? Most organizations or most auditors or the majority of auditors wrote, say rotate passwords every 90 days it, because we've always done it. No one knows why. It's just because, well, that's the way we've always done it. So users get frustrated. They can't remember. So they literally look outside and they come up with their password. They're like, hey, it's kind of chilly, totally winter. And I need a number, winter 21. This is the gift that keeps on giving. Now, if you're a defensive person, ban any password with the, with the word winter, fall, autumn, spring, or summer. Just outright completely ban those. What I've seen in other, or other places too is people like the year, really love that year. So you might have the, the company name, followed by a year or a month and a year. Um, default credentials. You see here is a keyboard walk. If you look at the, the left row, right? So you've got one Q, A, Z, hold down shift, and you got the next one right next to it. In fact, it's funny, in the before times when I was teaching with live people in the same room, yeah, that, that used to happen, remember? Remember, remember? Um, I could hear these people entering their password because it's a very rhythmic tick, 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 tick. And you're like, well, you're using a keyboard walk. Guarantee it. We can hear it because no one types like that. No one's got a rhythm exactly like that unless you're in a typing class. All right. So now maybe you've, uh, uh, with your scans, or maybe you got in with a password, you found something. Now what? 
Well, remember, document it. If it's not in the report, it didn't happen. Document it, document it, document it. Add it to your notes, put it in the report, whatever. Also, let's say you're using some sort of tool to identify issues. Maybe it's a vulnerability scanner. Uh, maybe it's uh, some other tool, Nmap, with its um, scripts. Just because a tool says something is vulnerable doesn't mean it is. Similarly, just because a tool says this is super critical or this one doesn't matter doesn't mean that's true. So adjust accordingly. Don't just blindly take the output from a tool. We'll talk more about this uh, next time as well. Use the tool. Don't be a tool. This is guidance. These tools are giving you guidance. Uh, the big ones I see here are uh, vulnerability scanners will say, this is the worst bug in Apache of all time. Is it exploitable? No. So what's the risk? Right? What's the risk? This PHP version is super vulnerable. Okay. Are they using those functions with input from a user? And can you get the right heap allocation, stack allocations, whatever, to pull this off? Also, probably not likely. So just because it's reported as a critical in both of those cases doesn't mean it usually is. Uh, Google, right? Search, ask for help. Now, if you're gonna Google and you find exploit code, make sure you test it first. Uh, test it first. What you don't wanna do is grab some random code and run it in a target environment and be like, yeah, YOLO that's that's not safe. Don't do that. I mean, worst case, you've brought an implant now into the organization, right? And people are really worried about that now, especially after solar winds. Maybe if you use the tool wrong, it causes some sort of negative thing. And in fact, in our AMA, we talked about that where well, one of the guys used a tool and it looked like it just did one thing, but it kept running and doing other things and ended up locking out accounts. Um, none of us would have known some of those things. And you're like, oh, well, I guess I see how some of that happened. But test your tool first. Dang it, Joe. So Joe, <laughs> blind hacker's in here. He's like, yeah, you know what you should do? Just just open up Cali. Go to open up Armitage and fire up the Hail Mary. No, no, sir. <laughs> do not. I love Joe. All right. So you have your shell. You have access through an exploit, through passwords. That's not the end. That is not the end. In fact, in my not so humble opinion, this is where the fun begins, not the end. This is where it begins. Now I have access. Cool. I'm going to use this access to get other access, to pivot, to escalate. Right? If you think about it, the bad guys aren't going to get in. What they don't do is they don't fish someone in your organization and then stop. But like, cool. So glad Brenda clicked on that. No. Brenda clicked on it, but now they're going to use that access because, and then get to Steve's computer because Steve now has a bad password. And they use that to move throughout the organization. And you, as a high-value pen tester, need to model the real-world threat actors. Use your existing access to find other vulnerabilities, other misconfigurations, other issues to help them become more secure. Related to that, keep your eye on the goal. The goal is not domain admin. The goal here is the data. And I like to go for the data first. And the reason is, if Brenda or Steve, I am able to compromise their account, their computer, whatever it might be, and I can immediately get to the sensitive data, 
that's a significantly larger risk than if I have to get to Brenda or Steve, pivot around a little while, escalate, and then get to the data. There's more steps, there's more dwell time, there's more opportunities to get caught. But if, if Steve in marketing has access to the intellectual property, now you've got a much larger problem because any compromise of any user in your organization could lead to a significant, significant issue. So focus on the data. If you want to come back later and try to go for the fun technical uh, wins. Also, take a breath. I mentioned this a little while, a little bit earlier. Take a step back, think, right? We talked about the rabbit holes and getting on in, into those and going too far and not reporting. Also, once you get access to a system, check yourself every once in a while so that you don't get into the rabbit holes. Stop and say, okay, where would the data be? If I was a normal user, where would I put this sensitive data? How would I handle it? How would I have passwords? How would I store them? Think like the user. But at the same time, don't think like the user. So if the normal process is A, B, C, D, what happens if you go from A straight to D? So you need sort of two conflicting uh, scenarios here. Take some time, sit back, think about both. Again, ask other folks. If you're stuck, like, hey, I don't know what to do here, ask people on your team, ask the target. Like, hey, we have access to this. We're, we're kind of stuck. Do you have suggestions? Remember, you're on the same team. The blue team, a good blue team, wants the pen testers to find issues so that they can be mitigated. Or at least they'll be aware of it, right? Some executive might say, we accept the risk. But at least they know the risk is there. And it's your job to identify it to help the blue team, the defenders, IT ops, whatever, make better security decisions. So those goals, related to that, focus on the data. I had to mention that. Focus on the data, don't take the data. Don't take it and exfil it. If you take all of the credit card information and you pull it back to your computer, congratulations, you're now a breach. If you take the health information for people and you pull it back to your system, you're not a doctor, you are not a medical provider in, chair, in care of quite literally any of those patients, you are now a breach. Don't do it. It put risks on you. It put risks it puts risk on the target organization. I tell target, our clients all the time, your data is toxic to me. If I get it on me, I need to like sanitize and clean up. So related to that, like after a, report, a test is over, once the invoice is paid, reports go into an offline archive because I can't lose data that isn't accessible someplace, right? So be careful. Demonstrate access, but what you don't have to do is steal all the data. I was at a, a presentation one time, and um, this newer pen tester was talking about how he would grab all of the data to demonstrate that he could take all of the data. And he was going on and on, and, it, and it was, it, he was passionate. It was kind of funny. You could see the, the audience getting kind of excited. But I looked around at a couple of people with a little bit of gray hair, and, and they had the same look on their face too, like, and I, 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 was, I, I was that guy. I raised my hand and I'm like, I'm, I'm sorry, can we stop for a second? Don't steal the data. If you do, you're a breach. Don't do this. If you ever did this on my network, I would fire you on the spot. If you were my employee, I would fire you on the spot as well. Don't do this. This is a significant risk. I get what you're saying. Demonstrate the risk. Don't take it. All right, let's talk a little bit about tools. Now, we only have an hour for the whole presentation. So there's we don't have a ton of time to go through tools and it changes very, very quickly. What I suggest to you is find tools that are interesting to you. Learn about them, practice with them. 
You want to learn some new C2? Cool. Check out the C2 matrix. Find a pairing of different features that you want and, and practice with those and then use those. Related to that, attack is your friend. The cool thing about MITRE ATT&CK is it gives you um, a ton of techniques. It also links to tools that use those techniques. In addition, it looks, link, links to the groups. And it shows you, so like APT 482 used this technique, this technique, this technique, and this technique. And what you can do is learn this is the mind of an attacker. And now you can use that in your tests. Because you're not gonna get, you know, we're not gonna hand out a report that we did for a client that shows our methodology because it's got tons of sensitive client information and no pen test company is gonna do that. But when you see these reports on real adversaries, the whole thing gets put out there. Another super important thing, learn to pivot. This goes back to grab a tool. Find your C2 of choice. Learn how to move from one system to another. Hey, that fish has landed. Or if we simulate that fish, how can I uh, landing and I start with access to a computer, for example, in an assumed breach, how can we use that access to move to the next system? And again, this the, the tools here change very, very uh, quickly. But Put together some tools. Uh, Linux is free. You can download versions of Windows and use them for a period of time and then destroy it and build a new network, right? So you can do all of this uh, for free. All right, so, so that is going to wrap up here. Part two, the method. Next up, we have part three three, the report. So we'll talk through documentation. We'll talk through some of the discussions after you deliver the uh, the report. Don't forget, we are going to have the Wednesday offensive. In fact, maybe by the time you see this on YouTube, the Wednesday offensive is already a thing. Uh, no slides, 30 minutes with random, uh, random, with, with others in, in the security industry. We'll get their thoughts on a subject, cameras and microphones on, and we will uh, chat. And again, if you've got any pen test questions, want to reach out, feel free to hit us up with the contact info. All right. Yes, good All point. Right. Someone asked, what is C2? C2 stands for command and control. Good deal. All right. So questions, okay. Justin. We got questions for you. So what we have is starting all the way in the back. Um, uh, do you report any non-exploitable weaknesses? Yes, yes. Now there's a lot of nuance there. So if it's like, for example, we'll report in our reports, it's an informational finding, like these are the accounts where they were Kerber roastable. So we pulled hashes back for this, but we weren't able to cr crack any of those. We'll document some of those. Uh, for example, the Apache and the IIS flaws that we see over and over again, that the, the likelihood of exploitation is exceptionally low. We still document those, but we significantly downgrade them. It says, hey, look, there's an issue here. And the issue isn't directly that software. There's a process that has failed and there's now out of date software um, or operating systems in the organization. Okay, uh, what do you use for taking notes? Cherry Cherry or anything else? Any Anyone, you think ask if anyone was using Faraday or a tool like that? No, we use, um, I mean, we put a lot of documentation in our methodology. Uh, we've got very full, rich methodology in our reports. Other than that, we use OneNote. Uh, Jeff was asking, is there any chance we have a shareable example uh, of an attack path? No. We should probably no, the closest thing we're going to find is going to be, and I, I saw that question, I think that goes to the, the MITRE stuff, because the MITRE stuff, you do see the attack path. Okay. Let me make sure I'm reading this right. What do you do when they say you can't password guess because they have the two-factor authentication and it doesn't matter if the passwords are bad? Um, sometimes there are specific systems that don't support the 2FA. Um, so that that's that's one option. 
Um, Mike Saunders on our team has done a couple of pen tests where he used broken the 2FA by using specific services, literally clicking through the web page. Like, for example, I think there was one where it was as simple as enter username, enter password. When it prompts for the two factor, you just browse to a page and you're already in. Um, there's other weird tricks like that. So part of it is validation that the two factor does indeed work. Okay. <clears throat> when you get access, you let the org know and move into assume breach, or do you wait until the report is finished? Um, depends. It, it depends. Well, if it's a longer test and we've got regular sort of conversation, we'll say, "Hey, look, this is where we're at." Um, it, it depends a lot. Depends a lot on the kickoff call and what they want to do. Um. Some orgs, and this is, I find this really frustrating, is the second we get access, they're like, cool, let's kill that. And then they won't give you new access. And you're like, wow, well, there's a whole bunch of vulnerabilities we now missed behind that because you killed us. There's only so much I can do. Um, we get this asked, we got we got asked this question in the Ask Us Anything too, but is there, ha has there been any pen test that you've done where you couldn't gain access? What happens at that point? Yeah, so short answer is yes. There is still value. So and we'll talk more about some of this about the next in the next presentation. But if you can support their positive findings in like the executive summary, say, look, you're crushing it in this these these aspects. Um and, and say, so when they take it to the to the boss, like, look, we're doing good. This these reports aren't just for tell me where things are bad, but it's also this thing was really, really solid. Also, make sure you look for the smaller wins. This goes back to, for example, um, Mike has a great blog post called, um, actually two of them. One of them was finding the silver lining uh, and getting your teeth kicked in. Um, another one is getting to the actual goal. In both of those cases, we weren't able to get all of the data, but we got some. And, and some is interesting because if a, a real bad guy can get some of the data, now you're in the news. Now you got a breach notification, right? It, the bad guy doesn't need all the money from the bank. A few million dollars, they're very, very happy. Okay, uh, a few people ask this or answer this for you because I think you said this many times, but do you shred key material and passwords after the pen test? Um, so that... This is getting a little bit technical. So do I shred them? No. And the reason is with solid state drives, that's not a thing anymore. A simple deletion uh, is enough. So um, there's sort of two thoughts with that. Do we save the passwords and use them on other tests? Some organizations do, do that um, because if the password is used at one org, it might be used someplace else. And if it's not tied to the user, I, I, don't, I don't see a problem with that. Um, instead of taking screenshots all the time, are pen testing sessions allowed to be recorded? I've heard people do that. That sounds awful. Because now <laughs> I have to go back and try to find the video. And, like, and nobody wants to go back and like people, I get people all the time like, can I come watch you hack? Oh my God, it's boring. It's really boring. It's a lot of like digging through data, trying to find the interesting thing. It's not like TV. Tom Cruise, the beautiful woman, right? It's not like that. It's a lot of archaeology. Right? You find the bone and you sit there for an hour and you, you use the brush to get to get the, the dirt off the bone to finally get that thing. Um, I don't find that useful. That said, I have heard people do that for incident response or like legal and, and stuff. What about vulnerabilities uh, that are uh, complex and they take a lot of time and engagement? Uh, but they can't be exploited. Do you, let me let me read this right. What about vulnerabilities that, because of the amount of time of the engagement, engagement and complexity, that can't be exploited, but that you think could be exploitable and be critical? Will you mark them as only potential, or you assign them uh, a different criticality? Yeah, I mean, I would leave it what I think the risk is, but we would add a note to say, I think this is bad, but we couldn't verify. So be honest. Right, be honest with them and say, look, this one's really bad. We don't have enough time to look at it, but this one I think is really, really bad. 
Okay, last two. Uh, if you can't get access externally, do you then proceed to an internal test, or is it that a subject to client requirements? Completely client requirements. Yeah. And how often does it come up that a network or system is actively being compromised when you conduct the test? Um, not terribly often, but it does happen. Um, we'll also get calls to like, hey, is this traffic from you? Like, no, it's not ours. Like, okay, can you stop the test for a little bit? So it, it's it's not uncommon, but I wouldn't say it's super common either. All right, and if I'm not seeing any more questions, that the is Network it. Six here says Tim thinks he's Tom Cruise. No, in every Tom Cruise movie, <laughs> we buy. Tom Cruise is with the beautiful woman, and they take the computer out to the fat guy in the van. That's me, <laughs> that guy in the vein that they kind of mock a little bit. Appreciate everybody for being here, and uh, we will see everybody next week.